Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about technologies, projects and people driving decentralization and the blockchain revolution. I am Friederike Ernst. Today I'm speaking with Kyle Samani and Twitter Jane, who are the founders of Multicoin, a crypto VC firm that started out back in 2017 when there weren't so many crypto VCs yet. And um, it's rumored to be the most performant VC fund ever. Before we talk with Kyle and Twitter about Multicoin, um, let me tell you about our sponsors this week. Paraswap is a multi-chain DEX aggregator. This means that um, through Paraswap, you can easily access the liquidity of various different decentralized exchanges. The protocol automatically finds the cheapest liquidity for you, so you can trade knowing that you're getting the best price. It's also pretty gas efficient. Paraswap recently added support for Avalanche, Polygon, BSC, and Phantom. And you can use Paraswap directly from your ledger in Ledger Live. Paraswap is also becoming a DAO, so if you have um, PSP tokens, um, that's something you should look into. And the DAO recently voted for the gas refunds program, um, so Paraswap stakers can get um, up to 100% gas refund on their trades on top of their auto compounding yield. So join Paraswap's Discord to learn more at paraswap.io slash epicenter. Um, we're also sponsored uh, by Chorus One. Um, so Proof of Stake offers a more performance, scalable, and energy efficient way of securing blockchains. Start earning rewards and contribute to network security by staking with Chorus One, a staking provider securing billions in assets and on over 25 decentralized networks, including Solana, Cosmos, and Ethereum. If you're an institution or want to run your own branded node, Chorus One's white label node as a service offering leverages the highly available and proven infrastructure enabling you to participate directly in decentralized networks. Head over to Chorus One and start your staking journey today. Hi, Tusha, and hi, Kyle. Thanks for coming on. It's uh, such a pleasure to finally have you on. I can't believe um, you've never been on Epicenter before. Uh, we've actually been on Epicenter back in Seriously? 2018. Um, it, yeah, it was a great episode. We, we had a lot of fun. It's great to be back. Fantastic. It's good to have you back. I, I will have to go back and listen to that now. Do you remember who, who, who did the interv interview back then? Uh, Brian Crane and uh, Meher. Meher, fantastic. That's a good team. Fantastic. Cool. So... I guess you've done this before. So let's talk about you first of all. So basically, how did you guys meet? What are your backgrounds? And what kind of um, made you become crypto VCs? Uh, so hi, everyone. My name is Tushar. Uh, I grew up in New York. Um, I met Kyle at NYU when we were studying finance. Um, we realized that we were both fans of the intersection of finance and technology. Spent a lot of time thinking about, you know, just how mobile was reshaping the world and how the internet was reshaping the world uh, during those very formative years for us. Um, we both, you know, have an entrepreneurial background. After uh, university, we went and started our own companies that were both, uh, you know, kind of modest little outcomes, which is to say not very successful. Uh, but, uh, you know, we heard about this blockchain thing along the way. Uh, which was very exciting. Uh, for me specifically, it was exciting because it was a new way to coordinate human economic activity and you know, incentivize people to work together in ways that they had previously not been able to. Um, we decided in 2017 to launch Multicoin after seeing that the technology was being validated, that you know, things were being built in the industry that were beyond just you know digital payments, but also you know enabling new types of coordination. Um, and you know, in fact, funny enough, uh, the day we decided to launch Multicoin was the day of the Gnosis ICO. So you know, back in in 2017, that was one of the major data points for us that showed us that crypto capital markets were going to be a big deal. It's kind of funny because we named the firm Multicoin because at the time when we started. Uh, a lot of people ask the question of like, will there be many coins or will there only be one coin to rule them all? Uh, and this was, you know, back when Bitcoin maximalists had a lot more political power in, within the crypto ecosystem and, you know, shouted down anyone creating another coin as just another shit coin. And, you know, we wanted to be very explicitly against that and say, you know, we believe, you know, with complete conviction that there will be many tokens, there will be many coins that will do different things. Um, so that's a little bit of the history of, you know, 
uh, how we met uh, and how we decided to start Multicoin and why we called it Multicoin. Super interesting. Given your backgrounds, I mean, you both studied finance and then you both started separate um, companies in the in the kind of in the medical field, right? I mean, Kyle's yours was like a Google Glass based app and Trisha, you had like this this patient data company, right? So basically you, 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 you had this you, you, you had this very strong entrepreneurial background um, and then you moved into a, a new field and B a new discipline. So wouldn't it have been um, so why did you become VCs? Why didn't you start um, an application or a protocol or you know a suite of tooling or something? Why, why a VC? It was it was kind of through the fall of 2016 and early 2017. Tushar and I were chatting pretty almost daily about various crypto things, um, and we were just getting both both more and more excited and both kind of losing interest in other things. Um, and so we did have a conversation in the April May time frame uh, of 2017, saying you know what what should we do? Uh, both of us kind of knew a couple of things about each other fairly well. One is that we're both like kind of insatiably curious. Um, I can spend my entire day reading just like all day, <laughs> uh, as can Tushar about different different subjects and ideas. Um, second was we wanted to, we, we both knew that there was an, a really interesting opportunity to educate the space um, and share our ideas and, and help the ecosystem move forward. Um, and that's why we started blogging so, so early on was, was to do that. Uh, and we we had a we had felt that the amount of uh, uh, th- that of thought, thought leadership being put out by other investors around crypto was was quite lacking. It's gotten a lot better over the years, um, but but still, I would argue is like not not enough. Um, and we kind of re- identified that hole in the market fairly quickly, and that that turned out to be a very effective strategy. And I think both of us all just both had kind of like a, a desire to uh, just like focus on our thinking and our, our curiosities, and so. That that kind of na- natural set of desires led us to to want to start an investment firm uh, instead of uh, operating operating business. We had done the operating business thing. We had learned a lot. I think we both had a few battle scars from that, <laughs> and we're uh, <laughs> interested in trying something else. Yeah, and just to add a, a little something there, I remember thinking explicitly at the time, you know, what does the ecosystem really need? And this is, you know, 2017, people are doing ICOs for like really weird, wacky stuff uh, and concepts that quite frankly, like don't make sense. You know, you're going to use this coin to pay your dentist or you're going to use this other coin to pay for coffee. Like it's just like nonsense. And what we realized was that there was, like Kyle said, a lack of understanding of how to think about this asset class. Right, because the asset class was new, and the heuristics for how to value these things, or how these things, you know, would capture any value or, or be, um, you know, marketable in any way, you know, those heuristics were just lacking. Right, if you think back to all of the heuristics that people have about traditional equity markets, well, those were created in the early 1900s as equity markets were just getting started. Like the idea of <laughs> valuing a company off of discounted cash flows. You know, it isn't a concept that's been around since ancient times. Like that, that was something that was created by, you know, this discipline of value investing when the asset class got popular. And we realized that that was what crypto really needed at the time was those types of heuristics because there were a lot of investors who were curious, who were interested in what this technology could be. But, you know, they're full time investors. They're not full time crypto investors. They couldn't spend the time to develop those heuristics. So the first one that, that we did was uh, Kyle published a post on understanding token velocity, which I think is the first post that we ever had that went viral, that you know got a lot of attention. Uh, you know, we got a bunch of deals off that post. I think we're still getting deals off that post. So it, it's one of the highest ROI pieces of writing on the internet, probably. Uh, and it was just to explain to the world that hey, having separate coins for separate payments like does not capture value uh, because of the token velocity problem, which has since then become very popularized. But, you know, we saw that as a way to contribute value back to the ecosystem and probably, you know, was the most effective way for the two of us to contribute value back to the ecosystem beyond if we had actually been entrepreneurs building something. Yeah, I mean, I totally get that. And I mean, thinking back 
um, to 2017, there were a small number of, of crypto VCs, right? I mean, not, I mean, today it's uh, everyone and their grandmother are crypto VCs. So, but I mean, back then it was literally Polychain, Union Square Ventures, Metastable, maybe Fabric or something, but they weren't super vocal about their investment hypothesis, right? So basically you guys were maybe the first people who really said, look, we're investing in this and this and this because um, this is the way that we think it's going to pan out. We think in public. For, for better and for worse. <laughs> <laughs> let's talk about, let's talk about your, your thinking. So, um, What's what's your current investment uh, thesis, and has it changed over the last couple of years? Um, I think the investment theses have definitely evolved over the past couple of years. I think uh, you know we just have seen more projects, more data um, that that helps us understand how the technology will be used. But at the high level, the investment theses are are pretty clear, right? Uh, we've written a post about this, uh, explaining out the, the mega theses. I think we can add a little bit to that. But, um, you know, the first mega thesis that we had is DeFi, right? By having units of value, whether they're tokens or equities or bonds or currencies or, or you know, commodities, etc., all on a programmable ledger that works anywhere in the world permissionlessly, you can bring access to capital markets to more people. You can include more people in capital markets. And that creates a lot of value and creates a lot of wealth uh, for the world because you, know, you want everyone in the world to be able to participate in capital markets. Um, Kyle, maybe you want to talk about Web3 thesis? Yeah, I mean, we were very, fairly early to start investing in kind of Web3 infrastructure things, starting with Live Peer and the Graph back in the early part of 2018. Um, and I think another thing we've developed conviction in uh, especially over the last like six months or so has been that you're going to have decentralized databases. Um, ceramic kind of being the most notable and, and there's other teams trying to tackle this problem as well um, for storing user owned data that is not financial. And I think this is going to be, if you, if you just look at the developer ecosystem around ceramic now, it doesn't get a lot of airtime um, in, in the press and on Twitter, but it's a, it's an impressively large uh, percentage of the overall crypto ecosystem is now, leveraging ceramic in some way um and I'm, I'm quite optimistic we're gonna have a handful of tools that look and feel like ceramic um and are just offering these decentralized database things um and i think that's a really really big opportunity with obviously with elon buying twitter um i get the sense twitter is going to do more crypto -y thingies um i don't think his first objective is going to be to move the database from postgres or whatever it is to you know to uh, ceramics but like uh, I think that design space just became a lot more probable that Twitter does cool stuff there. Um, and I think that's going to provide a lot of inspiration for developers to build new kinds of things. So yeah, we're, we're very, very excited about decentralized databases. You were also one of the early investors in Aweave, right? Uh, yeah, correct. We, we, we're not in the ICO. On the, I believe the I, Arweave ICO was in the fall of 2018. Um, we learned about Arweave in the spring of 19. Um, and completed our first investment in, in June of 2019 in Arweave. Again, that one just kind of struck us as, I think there needs to be permanence. We, we did not expect NFTs to, to blossom in the way that they have. Um, and that turns out to have been just a phenomenal use case for Arweave. And if you look at most of Arweave's growth in the last six months, uh, most of it is coming from NFTs, uh, spe specifically around the Metaplex integration. That's been just an amazing uh, integration for both Metaplex and for Arweave. Um, and, and the other thing we've obviously seen is uh, a lot of layer one teams and layer two teams using RWE for data availability. Um, so it's been very cool to see that uh, those kind of, pro this thing find product market fit in, in those kind of two major use cases. Um, where there's a lot of over low level infrastructure that needs to get built. You need to have um, storage. You also need to have databases. You need to have bandwidth. You need to have compute. And generally speaking, the higher up the stack you go, uh, the harder those things get to do in a decentralized way. Um, and so we're, we're excited to see more and more of that stuff that stuff happen. We've announced Ceramic and Fluence maybe a month ago, a month and a half ago. Um, and there's going to be a lot more to be done. Yeah, that was also the first I heard of Ceramic. So somehow this had completely bypassed me. Um, 
So in terms of um, composability and the money Legos that you just talked about in terms of DeFi, um, there were also, um, I mean, you, you guys were early to, to the DeFi game, but there were also, um, I remember very notable exceptions where you decided to not invest in DeFi projects that would have been um, pretty lucrative, like Uniswap, for instance, because you fundamentally objected to the tokenomics. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so broadly, you know, we try to think about value capture in DeFi or in crypto broadly from first principles and just think uh, in the very long term. You know, we're not focused on shorter term, you know, what will the capital markets think of this? In the short term, the capital market is a voting machine. In the long term, it's a weighing machine. And it's really about your ability to capture value over the long run. And, you know, we believe Uniswap built something innovative and really cool, um, especially given the gas constraints of Ethereum. You know, if you want to have a decentralized exchange, you, you know, this was the way to do it. And it has clearly been very successful in attracting trading volume and users and assets. Uh, however, the Uni token itself doesn't capture any of the trading fees that are earned by the Uniswap system. And the instant that they do turn on fee capture, which you know they they could you know uh, potentially do that and say you know of the thirty bips fees going to liquidity providers for a standard pool. Uh, five bips actually ends up going to the token holders instead. Uh, we just see that as uh, indefensible in the long run uh, because it's just rent extraction without providing any value back to the protocol or to the users of the protocol, um, right? And that's very, very difficult to execute in a world of open source and permissionless access where someone else can go and copy your code and say, hey, you know, we just don't take five bips away from you as liquidity providers. Why don't you use this instead, right? Um, and you have aggregators who will route traders' um, orders to wherever, you know, gives them the best fill. So, you know, the, the users aren't necessarily loyal to a specific exchange. They want the best price over the long run. So given that you know confluence of things, we just didn't see a way for a token in that system to sustainably capture value. And we actually published a thesis about this that I think is one of the best uh, theses that we've published. It's called Protocols Don't Collect Fees, DAOs Manage Risk. We published it uh, you know, something like six, seven, eight months ago. Um, and in it, we talk about specifically DeFi value capture, where there are cases where a token can take a spread or take a fee, right? An example is a DeFi derivatives market, something like Mango Markets, for example. You know, we think that Mango Markets can sustainably collect a fee off of trading volume going to the Mango DAO or the Mango token holders because they offer an insurance fund, where because it's a leveraged trading protocol, if a winning trader makes too much money and the system you know, becomes um, insolvent based on how much you know, customer deposits are in, or trader deposits are in there, then the Mango Insurance Fund has to cover that loss. And if the Mango Insurance Fund cannot cover that loss, they will print new Mango tokens or you know, use Mango tokens off the balance sheet and sell them into the open market in order to make sure that the winning traders are made whole. And traders on leveraged trading platforms want to know that there's a big insurance fund. They want to know that there's a big backstop in case their trade is really, really a big winner and that you know whoever traded against them gets blown out and you know the risk engine isn't able to handle that well. Uh, and so in exchange for providing that type of insurance, uh, in a sense, to those traders, they're providing a service that allows long-term sustainable fee capture for something like Mango, whereas you know something like Uniswap, where there is no long-term value going from uni holders to users of Uniswap, right? So that, that's really the key thing that we look for is like, is there some risk in the system that 
can be managed by the token um, rather than you know trying to put all of the risk outside the system and then just have the token extract rent because, oh, hey, we've wrote the code, and so therefore we deserve to extract rent. I, I just fundamentally don't believe that that is a sustainable model. Has this thinking changed um, since you published the thesis? Because I mean, basically, if you look at the if you look at um, the market since then, um, Uniswap very much is is still around, despite the fact that often you can actually usually you can get better prices elsewhere. If you go to to a Dex aggregator, right, you'll 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 get at the very worst the Uniswap price. Um, so w why do you think um, interfaces? are so sticky. Do you think Uniswap really owns the user or do you think this is a temporary thing? That's a good question. Uh, you know, is there some unforkable state in Uniswap in the brand recognition? And the answer is like definitively yes today. People literally go to Uniswap's website rather than going to 0x Matcha or 1inch or, you know, one of the other aggregators that offers you better execution. You know, uh, so that that is currently the case. However, over the long run, I always like to bet on rationality. I think that, you know, markets can be irrational in the short run, but in the long run, humanity tends towards rationality. Um, and it, it's very hard to see something like that sustaining over the period of years and years and years. Um, you know, we, we're not short term focused. We're not thinking about, you know, what will the market think 12 months from now? That That's too soon. Right? We're thinking with a much longer time horizon. And our intention is to invest in things that we never have to sell because they have really sustainable value capture and we can just hold it for you know forever. Um, and in order to feel the conviction to hold something forever, you, know, you have to see value capture that's not just unsustainable rent extraction. Yeah, the other thing I would, I would add here is the Uniswap team, or should I say the Uniswap DAO rather, is... is actually choosing not to really answer this question. Um, the, the way they would choose to answer this question uh, is they would introduce fees that pay out to the uni holders. Um, and that's when you can actually uh, figure out for real what's working or not working. Right now, they're just kind of like floating in like the uni price is still worth billions because yay, I guess. Um, but once you introduce fees that get paid out to the uni holders, um, uni holders uh, are strictly uh, parasitic to both makers and takers. Um, obviously, the system works today without uni holders being involved, and it worked before you, the uni token existed, which is all the proof you need that that they're, they're strictly parasitic. Um, once you introduce those fees, now you're creating a lot more incentive for LPs and for both makers and takers to go elsewhere. Um, and, and so, I think that's also kind of core to the argument here. Um, is that if you're if this stakeholder group is strictly parasitic to the other two that are obviously the, the two important stakeholder groups, which are makers and takers, um, then the system will unwind a lot a lot more quickly. Yeah, that's fair. Um, and I think it's kind of it's this way of thinking, not not being afraid of being contrarian. This is actually a hallmark of you guys. I mean, basically, if you think back to 2018 or 2017 um and basically everyone everyone was an ethereum maximalist right so basically and uh, i mean a lot of them still are um and you guys invested into eos big um and i mean obviously we all know that didn't really pan out well but um this kind of led you to 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 invest in solana um when really no one else really wanted to back then um i mean in hindsight obviously it looks obvious um but back then what what exactly um gave you the conviction to invest um into ethereum competitor layer ones i, I think actually the most important thing has been w watching um really the ethereum foundation um and, and how they they operate so first just like uh there doesn't seem to be a sense of urgency at all, uh, which which I like find fundamentally problematic. It, I, I think it's actually um, 
very contradictory and basically almost hypocritical to say, we believe our technology thing that we're building is going to like be one of the most important things in the history of the world. It's going to enable all this new human coordination and good for freedom and sovereignty and yeah, whatever. And then say, yeah, but like, we're also going to like kind of relax while we're building it and like not try very hard. Um, and I, I like, I don't know. I just, I really struggled, struggle with that. I think that's been, that's been a big part of it. And then the second part of it has just been like, uh, the, the, the research team is really not focused on what I'll call like product development. Um, and, and so like, it, it's been like a, like, what is a layer one good for? And like, I don't know, like probably some DeFi things, maybe some NFT things. Um, if you're going to build an L1, let's say, and you say, okay, I believe DeFi is the most important thing in the world. I believe we're going to have lots of financial markets, right? And we want to build the best thing for financial markets. Um, then you would probably start to make a lot of optimizations in the design of the system accordingly. Uh, the most obvious of which is latency. You'd want to have as short of block times as possible because like if you have leverage in financial markets, you want to have low latency. All right. And like, you know, ETH2 design, I think they're talking about somewhere between six and 12 second block times. Uh, and it's going to be several blocks to finality, right? So you're talking, I don't know, 20 to 60 seconds to get finality. And like, I understand why the decisions they made based on whatever prioritizing like validator node count or whatever. But like, that's not optimal for financial markets. Um, like it's explicitly not optimal and they know that. And like, they're just choosing to optimize for like not the thing that it seems to be used for. Um, and I find that to be like extremely problematic from a product strategy perspective. And, and so, you know, we, we got into crypto in 2016 and by the end of 2017, I remember I went to the, uh, to DevCon three in Cancun. I remember Vitalik starting presentation. And I remember like, I was like, dude, I've been following this thing for two years. And like, this is not like nothing is happening. Uh, at, at the core protocol. Um, and I, I kind of, at that, that moment, I got very disenchanted because everyone at that conference was like super excited and like Ethereum is going to change the world, right? And it was all, all uh, 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 everyone was a little too happy and uh, started to really re-examine, you know, how things operated. Uh, I'll, I'll contrast this with Solana. Um, from day one, the architecture of Solana was build and support decentralized NASDAQ. And like, I think maybe that's a dumb idea to do. I don't know. But like, they were very clear from day one, that like, that's the goal. Um, and it turns out, you know, a year or two later, uh, as DeFi started to really work on Ethereum, that that, that probably, in, it became more and more clear that that is certainly one of the most important things a blockchain is useful for. There may in fact be others that are more important than that. I'm, I'm not yet sure. We'll see what emerges. Um, but I think that's a very, very important thing to, to do. Um, and, you know, after all this time, I, I, we've actually have grown more convicted in, in this kind of general frame of thinking. Yeah, to, to add on to that, you know, we realized after Vitalik's sharding presentation at uh, DEF CON 3 and kind of just like for talking to a bunch of the Ethereum people that Ethereum was going to choose the hard path to scaling. Right. It was going to choose the path with a bunch of unsolved computer science problems. And, you know, maybe they will solve them. Like th these are some very intelligent people, you know, way smarter than me who, who are inventing new stuff. Right. They're, they're inventing uh, new ways to get these computer systems to talk to each other. Uh, but it was just very ambiguous on the roadmap and the timing because and, and through no fault of their own, it's very hard to project when you're going to have a fundamental breakthrough in computer science or any other academic field, really, right? So it's just an open-ended research problem of like, how do we do this? And we've seen this play out with the roadmap get delayed and get delayed and get delayed. Now, you know, reframe what it is and uh, get delayed again. Um, and it's just, like Kyle said, a lack of urgency and, uh, and open-ended research problems. And what we were really looking for was a more defined path to scaling. Uh, now, you mentioned EOS, uh, you know, we were contrarian in, in supporting EOS. That clearly was wrong, right? Like we can look back at in history and, you know, we lost money on that position like quite a bit. Um, and, you know, we were wrong about EOS. However, our fundamental thesis was not invalidated. What was wrong was the execution of the block one team, which was quite frankly atrocious, uh, like one of the worst uh, of any team out there um, th that I've seen, in, in fact, uh, you know, they raised the $4 billion and didn't spend it on anything useful for the ecosystem, 
which, you know, kind of defeated the point of, of the whole capital raise, in my opinion. And so we took our losses on that position. But as investors, you have to be very rational and you have to think, you know, why did something happen? And was it fundamentally something with the thesis or was it something idiosyncratic? And after a lot of deep thought, and you know, this was a lot of deep thought. We lost a lot of money on this one, right? Uh, we realized it was something idiosyncratic. So we said, no, we're going to double down. And we actually think that the deterministic approach to scaling um, that something like Solana offers is really attractive. And so we made that, you know, our, our largest bet. We, we um, have obviously been very vocal about it. And we doubled down because we had the conviction there, despite, you know, having taken losses on the first time we invested in that thesis. Yeah, I, th I think there's a lot of there's a lot of insight here. So basically, if if um, if I try to reframe this in terms of um, the blockchain blockchain trilemma, so basically security, scalability, um, and decentralization. Basically, you you're you're putting um, the Ethereum Foundation or the Ethereum core team, the Ethereum core developers are placing most of their eggs on decentralization, and you think that is the wrong prioritization to make. It's just backwards looking. Um, so yes, I, I think it is the wrong prioritization to make because I think Ethereum suffers from a problem where the Ethereum core team is just comparing themselves to Bitcoin because Bitcoin was first and it's bigger, right? And they're looking backwards at Bitcoin. And the thing is, like Ethereum is never going to be as decentralized as Bitcoin and it shouldn't try to be. It's okay. You don't have to be the best at every single dimension. Um, but you should optimize for the dimension that really, really matters uh, and focus on that. And I think Ethereum just was too broad in that focus. You know, they wanted to be as decentralized as Bitcoin. They wanted to be as scalable as Solana. They wanted to try and do all of these different things. And it's just, you know, not plausible to, to do that. And it slowed down the roadmap tremendously. Um, I also think that decentralization is a spectrum. It's not a binary thing. And I think that the value of decentralization is an S-curve. There is a, a, such a thing as decentralized enough where, you know, you don't need everyone to run a full node at home. That, that's pointless, right? Like, I don't check the maintenance of every airplane I fly in, right? I know that other people are doing that. So why do I need to run a full node when I know that other people are doing that? You know, I, I don't necessarily need to do that every time. Um, and so I just think, you know, over-optimizing on one dimension that turns out to be the one where there's an S-curve in value uh, delivered uh, was the wrong decision. Yeah, I think that's 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 a fair assessment to make. And uh, I think even the uh, most diehard Ethereum maximalist would have to concede that um, the Ethereum roadmap um, has... Uh, shrunken consistently over the last couple of years and i mean if you if you look at what's going to come with um east 2 now with um i mean even with uh you know after the merge with um with sharding i mean it's 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 not what was talked about years ago in terms of uh smart contracts sh sh shards it, it's it's just data availability shards so yeah uh, I think that's a completely fair fair assessment to make. Um, let, let's talk about one of your other investment hypotheses, um, and that's proof of physical work. Just real quick. I, I'm sorry. I, I'd like to add one more thing to that that I think is, is really relevant and um, important. Is Vitalik published a post recently uh, talking about how cross-shard MEV will lead to block production for Ethereum being centralized in data centers anyway. So, you know, through this economic incentive of cross-chain or cross-shard MEV, that is going to end up with block production being centralized anyway. So I, I kind of think Ethereum is ending back in the same position that some of these other chains are in that uh, the Ethereum community has been criticizing them for, you know, of having block production in data centers. I think Ethereum ends up back there because of the economic gravity that is cross-chain MEV and the highest yield validators on ETH 2.0 will be the ones running data centers, not the ones run on laptops at home. I mean, one could also argue the converse that uh, dApp developers will optimize for MEV-less protocols, right? 
Um, I actually, well, I, I don't I, think I that's mean, possible. It's, not that it's not possible. I mean, osmosis is doing it today. Um, it, uh, you obviously want to minimize MEV, but, um, MEV does not need to be zero. Um, we already have MEV today. It's called HFT and like, it, it's fine. Like the, the world works. Um, so that, that's, that's okay. Again, hi, hi, history is path dependent, right? So for the, the best example of this is the QWERTY keyboard. Uh, which is like known to be just stupid from a, a placement perspective, but like it's what everyone learned in the four. They actually made it slower in the fifties because the typewriters jammed and, and now we still use it today with electronic keyboards. But my point is to say that like you have to think about how these systems evolve. Um, and what was clear that everyone wants by far is the most important priority is low latency, high throughput, low gas costs. Like without question, those are the most important things. So you need to optimize for those first. If you could concurrently do get all of those things done and also have zero MEV via, let's say, something like Osmosis, um, that would be great. But it just adds a lot of complexity to the system. They don't have generalized smart contracts, right? Uh, block times are slower. There's a, a delay on just things getting included in the blocks because of the, the whole decryption thing, whatever. Like, you're, you're just introducing all of this new complexity. Um, and, like, if, if you can guarantee that the upper bound of MEV per trade is, like, I don't know, three bips or something, like... I don't know, like that, that might be worth it. Like that's totally okay. So, um, you know, MEV is bad, but it's not like it must be eradicated from the face of the earth bad. Um, and so, uh, w when we think about the evolution of these systems, we're thinking about like solve the most painful needs today. Uh, and then maybe you can come up with other creative solutions over time. Uh, one, one thing I think the, uh, world at large doesn't give enough credit to the Solana, uh, team for is just like, they assume that, everything is fixed and static and done and nothing will ever change again. And like, that is just kind of a stupid assumption. Uh, obviously all of these teams are building lots of stuff. Um, and all of these teams are learning from each other and adopting some and good, some good and bad idea. Right. So, um, maybe there will be a lot of ZK rollups on Solana in two years. Actually, I think there will be as uh, just one example. Right. And, and there others can, can happen too. So, um, you know, path, path, path dependency matters and you want, you want to prioritize based on kind of the most immediate demands and then, revisit other needs over time as, as you can. That makes sense. Um, so let's talk about proof of physical work. Um, it's one of your other uh, investment hypotheses and um, one that isn't as widely distributed yet as uh, the DeFi hypothesis, uh, hypothesis and the composability, right? Yes, it's, it's just newer, it's, it's wacky, it's weird. Um, really, I, I think it was inspired by helium, I think is the first implementation of proof of physical work in the real world, uh, for the listeners who aren't aware, uh, helium is a new business model for deploying and managing communications networks. Um, the first network that they built was a network for the internet of things or IOT. And, uh, the way that it works is, you know, regular people go buy a hotspot. Uh, they plug it in, they connect it to Wi-Fi, and they try and find good locations for these hotspots to create broad coverage in their area. And uh, they can earn tokens for doing so, for providing connectivity. And here, what we've done is we've taken what is a crypto economic game of, you know, go find the best location for your hotspot so you can mine the most tokens. And the output of that game is something with utility something that is actually useful for the world. Because if we can connect, you know, a bunch of fire sensors to have early detection of forest fires or flood sensors uh, for water um, preservation or uh, location trackers for pets or children or, you know, any, any of these other items to the internet, like that creates a lot of value. Um, but being able to create the network through the crypto economic game and then have something of utility created as a byproduct of that crypto economic game is the core of that proof of physical work thesis. Another example of that is an investment we recently announced in a project called Hive Mapper, where people are able to, you know, put a dash cam on their car, upload their dash cam footage, or annotate, you know, uh, maps uh, uh, on their desktop, and earn tokens for uploading their footage that. You know, the software uses computer vision to create an always up-to-date street map, right? Or for annotating those maps. And so we're taking these crypto economic games uh, that have proven to be very successful through things like Axie, which we've seen, you know, with many, many, you know, hundreds of thousands of users and 
a tremendous amounts of money flowing through the system. Things like Step In recently, or crypto economic games that you know aren't necessarily creating that externality that is useful for the rest of the world. Um, right? Proof of physical work is about using the crypto economic game to create a communications network or create a map that is owned by the people or create some other asset that is useful to the world. We're looking at other ideas of this around like, you know, electric car charging networks, which is going to be a major thing that we need to solve if we want to combat climate change. We need, you know, electric car chargers in more locations. So, you know, can we create a crypto economic game around that to incentivize people to put up more of these chargers to create the capacity for more electric cars? <laughs> you know, Maybe, all right, we're, we're thinking about that. We haven't made any investments there yet, still idea phase. Or can we do something around uh, battery storage to make the grid more resilient for renewable energy um, is another example of a thesis around proof of physical work that we're really interested in. And you know, fundamentally just looking for ways to implement a crypto economic game to build something useful for the world. Yeah, I think that's a very powerful investment hypothesis because I mean basically it gives you the ability to scale um, through collective ownership right so basically the the way that you actually ha um, facilitate um, payments more or less seamlessly hopefully um, through through tokens this is something that that was kind of missing and I actually remember something similar um, here in Berlin, probably like 20 years ago or so, so something, it was called Freifunk. Um, so basically you put up, and remember 20 years, this was before smartphones and widely available mobile data and so on. So basically the, the way that it worked is you, you bought a Wi-Fi router and you set it up um, in Berlin. And basically you, you either let um, other people join um, for free, or you actually um, got some credits for it. Um, and but basically if, if you let other people's people join for free you could um you could uh, use everyone else's for free as well um if you um, had other people pay for your wi-fi then uh you uh, you had to pay for other people's wi-fi as well um so basically i mean basically th those two antipodes were called you could either be a linus or you could be a bill um because i mean obviously this this back this, this was like in 2000 so basically th this was kind of the the dichotomy back then um but yeah and i think it never i mean basically i i knew lots of people who actually had them but this was a very specific subculture in berlin um and it never really widely took off and basically having the seamless integration of the ownership of the network this is something that is fundamentally uh new i'm and i'm super excited about helium we had them on last year or so uh super fascinating so uh yeah that example is really interesting, actually, because we've seen other examples like this. I think the key thing that's innovative here is, like you said, uh, the users owning the network, not just getting access to it, but also it's bringing markets to where those hotspots are placed, right? If you have the model that you described, where if you know I'm a Linus and, and I donate, right? Like I can just put my um, device, my hotspot anywhere, and it's the same, right? Whereas with something like the Helium model that, that I think is really innovative is by rewarding different locations with tokens based on how much coverage they create, right? You, ha you live in a high rise and you put in the effort to put your antenna on the roof and you, know, you got a big antenna and you, and you invest all this effort, you should get more ownership. You should get more tokens than someone who just you know, put the hotspot in their closet. Um, and I think that that free market incentive is really like a really important part of this uh, proof of physical work thesis. You know, you want to implement markets in capital allocation or time allocation decisions. Whereas, you know, centralized planning of, oh, every hotspot is equal to another hotspot is it, it, just like, you know, it's very like um, centralized committee, Soviet style planning, right? Like someone's deciding that th these are all equal, uh, but they're not, they provide different amounts of value. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe let's let's kind of change gears a little bit. Um, so walk me through the process of how you select your investment. So basically, how do you source them? How do you value the how do you evaluate them? Um, how do you decide um, whether an investment is made, and if so, um, at what ticket size? 
new deals get come in a bunch of places. I mean, at this point, we have a fairly large network of people in the crypto ecosystem who, who send us stuff, which is great. We obviously have a lot of relationships with, with entrepreneurs, and those guys have friends who are builders and stuff. Um, so we get a fair bit of that. Um, we tend to do uh, a fair bit of outbound as well. Um, I make it a priority to spend at least 30 minutes per day scrolling Twitter, um, looking at anything that catches my interest and like clicking links out from there. Uh, I, I think it's very, very important to never lose that curiosity. It's very inefficient because you, by definition, don't know where you're going. Um, but you can oftentimes find a lot of really interesting uh, things accordingly. Ceramic is, is a good example of that, actually. I had noticed like two or three startups mentioned they were building on Ceramic. And I was like, okay, that's like the second or third time. I was like, I got to see what this thing is. Uh, this is actually also how I got into Ethereum back in 2016. I, I saw a similar similar thing. So that's that's really important. We do a fair bit of that. And I'm I'm known for sending cold messages to, to founders on Twitter, Telegram, email, whatever. So do, do a lot of that. And then we obviously publish stuff on our blog in areas we're uh, interested in. We've published a lot about the Web3 stack. I recently did a thing about um, audio, rebundling value in the audio chain, rebundling value capture in the audio chain. To show our reason, did a post on proof of uh, physical work. Um, in general, whenever there's an area where we're kind of getting intellectually pretty intrigued, we will usually try and write something and, and use that as a, a basis for you know starting more conversations with more smart people in those spaces. So there's a lot of that. In, in terms of how we select thing, deals, uh, you know, there's there's different styles of investing, um, and that's a function of ticket size. It's a function of like who the customers are, is it developers, is it enterprise, is it consumers, is it whatever, uh, function of uh, just like a bunch of a bunch of variables. Um, we have started, you know, we've been doing this for a few years now, and we've started to figure out where we think the limits are of like, where are we really good? And what styles do we know how to do? And which styles do we not know how to do? Um, obviously, you can't be too rigid about those things because the market itself changes over time. And so... Um, you always kind of need to like be a little uncomfortable. You don't. Well, I think you, you don't want to be too strict about like your strike zone here. And so, uh, but you know, we we have a sense for our things we like, our types of things we like. Um, and usually, we're pretty quick. Like once we speak to an entrepreneur, if if it makes sense to us as being kind of fundamentally crypto native, um, and can leverage crypto to do something cool, we usually get excited pretty quickly, and we we make decisions usually within a week or two. Uh, frequently within a week because that's just how deals move these days. I set up a few calls with entrepreneur to try and I get involved fairly quickly and start kind of working working our way towards a deal. Um, there, there's no unfortunately magic to it other than that. Um, I, I think the only the only other uh, really generalized comment I would make is uh, I have a, a kind of a joke I share with the investment team, which is um, there's a lot of stuff we look at that like we think it will make money with a very high probability, but we find it to be boring. Not that it is necessarily boring, but just like to us, given our backgrounds and skill sets, we, we don't find it to be very intellectually exciting. Um, and so the, the rule I have with our investment team is if the entrepreneur calls you Friday at 9 p.m., are you going to answer the phone? Um, and you have to care enough about the thing to, you know, to want to answer the phone. Um, and I think that's a pretty important rule to have as an investor. Um, and so it, that's something we, we try and try and stick to. Uh, that means there's certain areas that we, we are not going to be as active in. Um, that's okay. Other people can do those deals and make that money. Like that, you know, that's fine. Uh, we just want to stick to where we can be in our strike zone. We are ex intellectually excited. And then when the entrepreneur calls, we're going to answer the phone. You are also known for writing pretty big tickets. Um, is, is, that, um, is that just you know, your risk inclination or is that just the way that you do business or is there a business rationale behind it? Uh, that we're just fortunate that we have our, our fund structures, uh, plural, uh, enables us to, to do that. We have our venture funds that we invest out of, which um, can write smaller tickets. And then our, our hedge fund is, is quite large uh, and we can write $100 million, $300 million tickets out of that thing. Um, we've never done anything in that size yet, but, you know, probably in the next 12 months it'll happen, you know, but we'll see. So we're fortunate we have a fair degree of flexibility there. Um, we generally are sensitive to not overcapitalizing a business. Um, uh, and in, in this startup environment, uh, or I should say if this fundraising environment, uh, a lot of founders feel like they can raise more money than they know that they need and they do it anyways. And, you know, like I get it. Everyone wants to have more dollars in the bank. Uh, 
we generally try and push back against that, but you know, like sometimes it's entrepreneurs do it and like, it's fine. It is what it is. Um, but when, when we are excited about something, we will size up aggressively. Um, and, uh, I think that's very important is to like lean in hard when you're very convicted. Yes. And I think the thing that allows us to do that is thinking for ourselves and thinking from first principles to build true conviction in something. Uh, and that allows us to have very concentrated positions. You know, uh, a lot of investors aren't investing for maximum returns. They're maximizing their logos. And like, you know, it's almost like they're trying to complete a collection, right? They're like, oh no, if that deal makes money and I wasn't in it, like my collection will be incomplete. Uh, what will I do, right? And so they, they try and get in a lot of deals. And the thing is like, if you see uh, an investor join uh, around and, you know, goes up 100x, but you sized it as like 10 bits of your fund, you know, like that's a 10% return to your fund. It doesn't mean anything actually in the, in the grand scheme of things. So, uh, you know, the reason that we do larger tickets is because one, we think for ourselves, we build conviction and we have concentrated positions uh, because of those reasons. And how do you construct your portfolios? I mean, is it kind of a, a, a deal by deal kind of uh, decision flow? Um, or do you have an overarching um, uh, strategy of uh, constructing the portfolio? So we do think about it overarching, um, right? And th there's a few factors here, right? The, the first thing we think about is what markets are we interested in? And the market size has to be big enough for us to be excited to, you know, meet that bar that Kyle mentioned of being willing to pick up the, that phone call at 9 p.m. on a Friday. Um, and if the market's not big enough to be that exciting, right, like the, then we're probably not going to go much further than that. Then the next step that, that we think about is what are all of the fundamental trade-offs if you were designing a product in that market? Because... In the things that we invest in that are at the very frontier of technology, whether it's you know computer technology or social technology in terms of coordinating people, uh, when you're at the very frontier, usually there's no one right answer. Uh, there's not one product that is just better than another. It's all trade-offs. Uh, you know, you're trading off something in order to optimize for the variable that you really care about. And so the, the second thing we do after we identify a market that we really like because the market is large enough to be exciting is we try to identify what is the right variable to optimize for. Uh, you know, the case study for that that I think is the most impactful is we identified the market for block space as being incredibly lucrative. We thought that's going to be an enormous market. We want to be very active in this market. And we thought what is the right thing to optimize for is block time, throughput, low fees. You know, that that's really what matters to optimize for. Uh, and so then we'll go and, you know, we'll try and understand what are all the different approaches to building based on that optimization function, right? And, and what are all the ways that you can do that? Who are all the people who are doing that? Let's talk to them and learn from the experts. And from there, we'll make investment decisions. So it's very top down in that way. Right. I find a lot of investors are investing like they're swiping on Tinder. They're like, do I like this one or not? And they just, you know, they just get served up a new deal and they decide let's swipe right or swipe left. Right. And, and we are really starting from first principles of, you know, like, do I like this market? What is the variable to optimize for? Who are the people building who actually fundamentally understand the trade offs and know why they're optimizing for the variable that they're optimizing for? Cool. Yeah, that makes sense. So basically, when when a founder calls you at 9 p.m. on a Friday night, um, what what kind of services do you provide to portfolio companies? I mean, so basically, if you look at VCs, right, I mean, there's a large spectrum of what they'll actually do for you. Um, so where do you sit on that spectrum? So usually a Friday at 9 p.m. phone call means there's a problem <laughs> and it's urgent. So... Uh, that means we're dealing with whatever the fire is at, at that moment in time. Could be a hack and money's gone or who knows what else, right? But that, that's obviously um, fairly idiosyncratic. But that's kind of different than like general portfolio services type things. I had a number of discussions on, on how we think about this at, at Multicoin. And the thing that we've decided we want to focus on is... If, if we're going to do portfolio services, it needs to be strategic to the company. So 
that, that means it's not just like, hey, we're helping you with this function uh, because like you need help in this function. That That's fairly commoditized. Um, rather, once I want it to be, hey, we're engaging so that we can help you make decisions that are going to change the outcome and trajectory of your business. Um, and that's really kind of where, where we, we engage is along that vector. Um, in, in practice, probably the most important uh, version of that is kind of what we call like full stack capital markets engagement. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, if you think about a company that goes public in equity land, it's an extremely structured process. Obviously how you work with the banks, the, the deals. Then once you go public, like how you disseminate information, you have these quarterly analyst calls, you have the quarterly filings, right? Like the, who can join those calls? It's like, I don't know, 20 analysts who work at 20 banks. Uh, like the public at large doesn't get to join those calls, right? Uh, and what, what is said is very scripted and, and, and structured and, and cagey. Um, and you look at crypto and it's like, I don't know, how do people learn about the token? And it's like, they fucking tweet at the CEO and like, maybe the CEO responds, right? Uh, so it's just a very, very different. And then and it's people all over the world in all time zones speaking 25 different languages. Uh, and so the kind of entire mechanism for engaging with the market at large is just like, it's just completely different. Um, the composition of the people who are in the market is different. How they want to consume information is different. Um, and uh, it, it's extremely unintuitive. If you're a founder, you've got, I don't know, 10, 15, 20 employees building whatever your, your thing is. Like dealing with that whole class of problem that I described is, is very unintuitive to most people. Um, and, and basically 100% of them do it wrong. Because um, uh, it's, it's hard and weird and new. Um, and it's like not strictly serving your customers, which is like the traditional kind of Silicon Valley mantra of like focus on the customers kind of a thing. Um, but it turns out it's a superpower if, if you can engage um, the, the market in a productive way. And so we, we help teams think through kind of all facets of this. Uh, what should the messaging be above the fold and below the fold? Uh, how should you think about working with exchanges and liquidity? How do you think about token design? Um, there's a whole bunch of variables to this that matter. How do you, on what cadence are you doing comms to the public and how are you getting that out there, right? Um, and there's just a whole bunch of considerations here. These are all fairly idiosyncratic. Um, we've obviously made some dumb decisions. We, we've watched a lot of other people make even more dumb decisions. Uh, we've, we've learned, but I think a lot of the dumb decisions are and are trying to avoid those on a go forward basis uh, and, and help those teams you know, avoid those things. Uh, I'd say that's kind of our primary vector um, uh, that we, we engage. We do a lot of work with token design in particular um, and some other stuff. I don't, too sure, maybe I'm, I'm missing something here. No, I think that that hits on uh, a lot of the key items. You know, first is engagement with crypto capital markets, understanding how crypto capital markets work. Uh, you know, we have worked with a lot of portfolio companies who've gone through this process, and you know, there's very few people out there who've gone through this process more than once. Usually, an entrepreneur is going through it for the first time, and you know, they they want some guidance. Next is token design. Uh, that is, you know, probably my favorite part of my job. Um, is just like trying to think of token mechanisms that can sustainably capture value, right? Uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, value capture earlier in this conversation. I think that is one of the most fundamentally important questions uh, that all of these projects have is like, you know, if you go build something and it's very useful and it creates a lot of utility, but you don't figure out token value capture, well, it's not going to be great for investors uh, to, to be involved in that project, right? And so like those things are great. Like I can go and do that out of, uh, you know, my personal account. And, and like, I, I would consider that a donation if I'm investing in, in something like that. Uh, right. It's not really an investment. Um, but when we're investing, we want to understand how the token will capture value. Uh, and, and we want to help them think through that and think through how that will be sustainable and not rent extraction. I just have an allergic reaction to unearned rent extraction. Um, and, you know, try to steer teams away from that actively wherever possible. And, you know, I would say the last category of things that we do for entrepreneurs is help them avoid unforced errors. There's a lot of unforced errors that people make because they just don't realize the second and third order consequences of what they're doing. Whether it's a design decision, whether it's a product decision, whether it's a capital markets decision or a hiring decision, you know, we have made a lot of mistakes. We've seen a lot of other people make mistakes too. And just helping portfolio teams avoid unforced errors, uh, I think is, is a huge value add. 
you're one of the few VCs um, who actually speak out vocally against projects that you feel are overvalued. Is that a business decision or is that just who you guys are? It's a good question. Um, I'd say it's more of the latter, uh, honestly, because from the VC perspective, right? Like you kind of want to be friends with everybody always. Right. Um, and you know, you just, you don't want to uh, give people a reason to not like you. Uh, however, you know, the, the way I look at this is like, we operate in public markets that requires public discourse. You need to be able to talk about these things in public. And if the large sophisticated investors who have the resources to do research and have, uh, you know, spent a lot of time thinking about it are censoring themselves, that is doing a disservice to public markets. That is doing a disservice to capital formation for our entire industry. You know, every new person who ends up buying something that, you know, everyone serious in crypto, you know, thinks that XRP is not going to be the global liquidity bridge. But, you know, if no one speaks out against it and no one says anything, then, you know, you just have retail come in and buy that because they don't know any better. And, you know, that is bad for the industry. That capital could have been put to much better work elsewhere to promote building useful things, right? And so I, I kind of see it as um, helping create value for the industry, probably, you know, at some cost to us, but uh, really like can't help it. <laughs> You've actually shorted tokens before, which is, which is very unusual for, for you know, a VC fund. Um, so, and to me, it also seems like, um, I mean, there are so many tokens where I know they're shit tokens and I would never buy them, but basically shorting them um, is, is a different matter because you, you have a limited upside in an, and, and you have an asymmetric downside, it just seems like a bad business decision, no? <laughs> I mean, you know, you know, the market can stay rational longer than you can stay solvent kind of thing, right? Stay solvent. Yeah, we, uh, shorting has decreased as a percentage of what we do pretty, pretty substantially. Uh, it's not 0%, but it's, it's pretty small for, for primary, not, not for the reason of like, annoying it pisses people off but just because like the risk reward profile is, is not there especially as our size has grown um but i want to add one other comment though kind of building on what tushar said about like you know to some degree we think it's our uh, kind of mandates like socially to uh call out problems um there's actually a little more than that too that that happens which is a lot of the best found like if we call out some bullshit and let's assume that our, our view is correct and that it was in fact bullshit, right? There's a lot of founders, really, really smart people who also probably believe that thing was bullshit. And uh, I think a lot of them appreciate the courage it takes to call out the bullshit. And so it actually makes a lot of those guys want to work with you more. It feels risky in the moment, but I mean, I've had a lot of founders call us and, and tell us like, dude, y'all are the only ones who fucking stick your necks out there. And like, I want to work with you for that. And, um, it, it, it wins you, it obviously pisses pe some people off, but other people, uh, are, are really drawn to it. Um, it's hard to obviously measure like the relative value of those two things and like counterfactuals here is, is pretty hard to do, but it's not as, uh, simple, I would say as, as it appears on the surface. Yeah. We're, we're just not scared of being wrong in public. You know, we've been wrong before. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> Right. Um, it, it turns out that nothing bad really happens uh, if you're wrong in public a few times. And I think it takes um, courage for people to willing to be wrong in public. Um, and I, I think that the market does appreciate that. Like like Kyle said, there, there are some people who do appreciate that and um, they want that kind of public market protection of having these narratives out there. Yeah, I agree. Speaking of being wrong, any investments that you regret missing out on? Basically, people, people, people who pitch to you, whom you turned down, uh, and uh, where it actually turned out to have not been a good decision. 
I mean, look, like there's a lot of things we've said no to that have made money. So I, I think the question needs to be a little, a little bit more specific. Um, I, I feel like maybe you have to, to quantify, qual- qualify it more to uh, like we agreed with the thesis and like got caught up on some dumb detail that ended up not mattering. Like those are the ones that like you really kick yourself for after the fact. Um, it's like classic middle of the IQ curve. Like just in like it, you know, um, I mean, I'm sure we've done it. I'm trying to think of something that comes to my mind, uh, where we were in the middle of the IQ curve. Uh, I don't know too sure what, what, what resonates stands out to you. Oh, I'm scrolling down coin gecko as we speak, <laughs> trying to, to find <laughs> examples because you know, they're, they're like Kyle said, there are a bunch of things that we passed on that made money, but that's not necessarily what we regret the most. Um, you know, he, he's right. The thing that I would regret the most is we were right about the market, but wrong about the variable to optimize for. Um, you know, maybe an example of that would be DYDX early days. Uh, you know, we were right about the market of decentralized derivatives. Uh, you know, we've published about it. We've made a number of other investments there um, and are quite excited by that market. Uh, we don't have a meaningful position with DYDX. It appears that team has executed extremely well um, and has, has built up, you know, quite a brand for themselves. I don't know, you know, what volume would look like if they turned off their liquidity mining, which, uh, you know, would be a very good experiment to run. Uh, I generally think a lot of projects would look very different without their liquidity mining um, kind of sheen on it to the, the, that's covering up some of the rough spots. But generally, you know, been impressed with their execution um, and, uh, you know, I, I think that that might be interesting. Another one might be Polygon. We looked at that early on. Um, and, you know, I think the thing we got caught up on was the technology was just not that compelling. Uh, but what we missed was that they're experts at business development and that, you know, in an open source world, you don't have to build the tech yourself. As long as you can get people to build on your platform and the tech is good enough, you know, you can go from there, right? Like the right now, the Polygon sidechain is just the EVM being run faster, All right, you, Let's just take the EVM and, you know, have it go faster. Um, but um, I think if someone else goes and figures out ZK rollups or, you know, maybe one of the four research teams they have figure out ZK rollups, that's really powerful. Um, and, you know, maybe the right variable to optimize for in the market for block space isn't necessarily the best technology. It's who has the best business development, right? And, and Polygon team is up there. Uh, we did do Flow, uh, which is similar in that thesis, right? Like Flow has the best business development, I think, for NFTs, at least so far. Um, so, you know, we have made a variety of bets there, but I think Polygon and DYDX are the two that stand out the most as uh, misses in, in the way that, you know, actually is painful. What what do you think um, the blockchain ecosystem will look like in three years? Will people know which chains the apps they use are on? Um, or will it not matter? People like to use analogies to reason about things because it can be helpful. Um, 95% of analogies written on the internet are wrong. Uh, um, the least bad analogy for blockchains is cloud providers. Uh, it is not a great analogy, but it's the least bad <laughs> of, of them. W- one of the ways in which cloud providers are, are fairly obviously different, there's a few, few obvious differences between them. Um, one is, uh, blockchains have tokens, uh, and you pay gas to use the things. It's possible gas is 100% abstracted. I, I'm not sure that it will be, but it's possible that it is. Um, but in the event gas is not 100% abstracted, then obviously like you will not see the native token. And so you'll know what the blockchain is. So unlike, you know, my mom obviously doesn't know if and Netflix is on Amazon or Google or Microsoft. Um, I, I'd say it's unlikely you get to that degree of, uh, you know, just not, not needing to know. Um, and the second, and actually this is maybe even more important is all the blockchain things have tokens. Um, and people like the tokens and they talk about them on the internet. (laughs) Uh, and so I I think it's likely people will know which blockchain things are built on just simply for that reason. Um, AWS does not have a token. And so it's just like, 
why do people have a reason to talk about it? <laughs> um, so uh, more than cloud providers, uh, less than today. Okay. Is probably is I, I'd say fairly high conviction correct. Yeah, I I think that's right. And, and then when I think about the specific chains and, and how that might work, my best current mental model of how the chain ecosystem will evolve is I think we will have kind of center of gravity in one monolithic chain that just is, you know, to use the city's analogy is like the biggest city. It's the one that has, you know, all of the finance activity specifically. You can't shard an order book. Sharding an order book doesn't make any sense. No one wants the third best bid or the fifth best offer. Everyone wants the best bid or best offer. That means you need to put the order book in one place, right? So I think you're going to have one big monolithic blockchain that has the order book and has you know a lot of the DeFi activity. And I think you have a lot of smaller chains, smaller in terms of state um, specifically, that all connect to each other using either cross-chain bridges like Wormhole or Layer Zero or something like an IBC type system in order to connect to each other with certain state guarantees or trust guarantees. And they all settle back down to that main chain as well. But I think that main chain needs to be as big as possible. And then you can have your you know specific uh, game with its NFTs and everything else live off on a side chain or a sub chain but I think it needs to then settle back or talk to the other chains in a, in a composable way using these types of bridges or um, other protocols. But I think that you know of those smaller chains by, by state, um, like a lot of the value in those is going to be captured by the apps themselves, right? The, the game that has you interacting with that specific Cosmos zone or that subnet or you know maybe their own implementation of Solana or, you know, whatever, right? Like is going off and going to capture a lot of that value, not for the L1 token that you know, uh, of the system that they're building, that they don't care about that. They're going to capture it for the game developer with the games token, right? And I think that actually the, the vast majority of the value is going to end up being earned and collected by that big instance, which is kind of the central hub where everything interacts. Which chain do you think that it'll be on? Or which chain do you think it'll be? Solana. Same for you, Kyle? Agreed. Okay. Dominance of DeFi. So, I mean, basically, if you look at the number of transactions today, um, I mean, a very large proportion of them are DeFi. I assume that number's going to go down. I mean, not total, but proportionally. Um, how much do you think it's going to go down in the next two years? And what other non-DeFi primitives are we going to see? Um, I think TVL as a measure is just kind of f flawed. Uh, like Serum versus Uniswap is a good example of that. Um, it just doesn't make sense, right, to have compared TVL of Serum to Uniswap. Um, so that, that's part of it. The liquidity mining programs and other things kind of distort those things. So I, I wouldn't really over-index on, on TVL. Um, it's hard to know exactly what to compare. I, I realize I'm kind of not answering the question. Um, but uh, my sense is that the probably right way to think about this is like what is drawing in retail users that is not DeFi and that is something fun and cool, whether that's Instagram NFTs, whether that's games, whether that's stuff like Audius, you know, whatever. And I think kind of sort of, 100% of those things will use DeFi in various ways. Um, so I, I would really be looking to, uh, I'd be looking to optimize just like general user growth of, of people doing stuff. Um, and as that happens, I think that will drive DeFi um, because all of those things need to have some notion of liquidity. They need to have some notion of, uh, of, of finance and money flowing through them. And I think Solana is, is extremely well positioned for that. There's, some awesome stuff that's going to ship this year. Uh, and it's going to change a lot of perceptions of Solana. Is there a thing that you think most people get wrong um, about the future of crypto? Uh, I think most people think too much that, that the past will represent the future. Um, or like, and this is the big, big example of this is like, look at Web3 thinking versus Web2 thinking. Um, 
you could have never come up with proof of work and permissionless consensus and whatever all these things. Um, it like if you're like a hardcore Web two person, uh, and so it required like a, a first order change in thinking to get there. Um, and obviously, Bitcoin is like kind of arguably like the purest form of, of a lot of that stuff. A lot of the hate Ethereum got in the early days was like that's too centralized. Oh, the why you know the why do this ICO and all these tokens and shit. And now everyone says, oh, Solana's too centralized. And you just realize it's kind of the same cl class of thing. Um, what, what our, our kind of view of the world is uh, the right way to think about innovation is, hey, look, like I, look, I would have never been early in Bitcoin. I was not early in Ethereum uh, because I just like didn't, I was too web to, you know, uh, mental frame. And so like we missed, like we missed that. Uh, we also had other jobs we were doing. So whatever, we were busy with our healthcare stuff. But like, I just wasn't prepared to rewire my brain into like a, a, a new kind of way of thinking. Uh, but once we did and we said, okay, we can accept this new way of thinking. Then the next question is, okay, well, how do I can take everything I can learn from the old paradigm and, and like, what can I apply intelligently? And like, there's a lot of things that you can do. Product design, um, user experience, messaging, comms, hiring business development teams. Like this is all just like blocking and tackling operational things. Um, the, the Web3 world, Bitcoin and Ethereum in particular, like just because of the culture and timing and whatever of all the other things around their, their foundings, were just like these very uh, loose orgs that like, you know, almost um, rebuked like a lot of the common called tech startup practices that are like generally accepted to be best practices on how to like do th get things done in the world. They just didn't do it. And I think they framed it primarily as like an ideological thing. Um, we're like, no, 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 we're not going to do it. It's going to be decentralized. The community is going to do it or whatever. Um, and I, that was probably necessary in the earliest days. Like, um, but like at some point it's become counterproductive because like as these things scale, as they get used by more people and get in more places, like you, you need to em embrace, like Facebook is not going away. Like Instagram is going to do NFTs, right? Zuckerberg has said this publicly. Um, you know, PayPal is going to do something. Twitter is going to do something. And, and so like, if you want to win the game, you need to win those guys and you got to do some stuff. Uh, and like, you got to show up and you got to talk to them and like, got to give them support and like whatever, whatever it is that they, they got to get done. Like you, you got to do it. Um, and, uh, I, I think, uh, you know, up until probably 2017 or thereabouts, um, the right mental frame was like decentralization first community first. And I think somewhere around 2017, 2018, probably the optimal thing to do changed uh, where it should be, look, leverage the technology so that you have, you can be credibly neutral and be decentralized, but then have as many commercial instincts as possible and like run it like a business. Um, and yeah, somewhere between 2016 on the early end and 2019 on the late end, like that, that, that flipped. And it wasn't obvious exactly what, what the moment in time was or what the event was, but somewhere in that range. I have a different thing I think um, most people are wrong about in crypto, which I, I think most people are wrong about Bitcoin, actually. Um, I think uh, people are wrong about Bitcoin's relevance to crypto broadly. I think that you know the crypto markets are decoupling from Bitcoin. Uh, I think that we have productive crypto assets and non-productive crypto assets. I think Bitcoin is clearly non-productive. You know, it's a digital rock. You, you, you buy it, it sits there, you don't do anything. Um, and I think that most of the world wants to interact with productive assets. I think most of the world wants to invest in productive assets. People like doing stuff. Um, I, I also just think that the scarcity of Bitcoin is actually replicable to an adequate degree with other assets. Uh, yes, Bitcoin has the strongest scarcity guarantees of any asset. But once again, just like decentralization is valued on an S-curve where you, know, you can have enough decentralization, I think the same thing is true of scarcity. Um, and so I think um, that you, know, you can go buy another asset that gives you substantially similar scarcity guarantees and inflation resistance as, as Bitcoin. Um, and th the last point I'll make on this I think the Bitcoin security model is fundamentally challenged over the next 10, 12 years. You know, we, we need probably three, four halvings before it becomes really clear that, hey, 
people don't want to pay enough in transaction fees on this chain to actually secure the chain. And that is going to create major, major problems. You know, you just need one big block reorg and it forces everyone to re-rate this thing. Um, and, you know, when you have a system that only has probabilistic finality, if I send you, you know, 100 Bitcoin, I am going to need to wait an extraordinary, or you as a recipient are going to need to wait an extraordinary, extraordinarily long time in order to confirm that transaction. This idea of like six blocks and, you know, no rollbacks anymore more than six blocks is going to go away as a security budget gets slashed. So I think that's something that, you know, a lot of people in crypto are closing their eyes to. They're not thinking hard enough about how that's going to evolve. And I think that people will be very surprised as that plays out over the next probably, you know, 10, 12 years. Yeah, or you need to annex the hard cap. And I, and I mean, that's kind of, that's kind of the meme. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's between a rock and a hard place for Bitcoin. I, I agree. Um, so what's, uh, what's up next for Multicoin? I mean, we're pretty happy uh, doing what we're doing. We love supporting portfolio companies, <laughs> uh, right? Like what we care about is working with the best founders to help them change the world. You know, we're not trying to build an asset management empire where, you know, we don't want to manage, uh, you know, thousand people or, or hundreds of people. Uh, we're a pretty small team. Um, we, we are content to keep it that way, right? That way, every entrepreneur who works with us knows that they're working with the A team. We're not big enough to have a B team. You're not going to get relegated to some B team if you're an entrepreneur. Um, and, you know, our portfolio company's success is our success. So really, that's what we're focused on. We're focused on finding new theses. We're focused on continuing to support existing portfolio companies, continuing to invest in the theses that we've already developed. Um, and, you know, just like helping crypto achieve the, lex the next level of maturity. I want to see a billion people interacting with blockchains. Uh, you know, that, that's really the dream. Um, and you know, I, I think that will be a major milestone. Tusha, Kyle, thank you so much for coming on. It's been uh, fascinating. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's good to speak with the people who, uh, who are not afraid um, to say things that some people won't. <laughs> well, look, the truth is uncomfortable sometimes, but that's okay. And uh, we'll, we'll all get better for it and keep pushing forward. And we're going to make this industry successful and get tokens in the hands of billions of people. Wag me. Wag me. Wag me.